Uh, good morning, and thanks uh, for joining this session. Uh, my name is Matthew Rozak, and I'm co-founder of Vesper. Uh, and I'm excited to talk to you about a new area that's developing in financial services at the intersection of fintech and uh, DeFi called hybrid finance. And what that means is um, there are lots of traditional uh, financial services companies trying to figure out how to make the most of crypto, blockchain, and decentralized finance. And then there's decentralized finance, which is looking at some of the assets under management, some of the opportunities to uh, create this shared surface area between traditional finance and DeFi. And there's a whole new vernacular that's developing in this space. Uh, farming, uh, aping, uh, claiming, staking, uh, banking. These are the new terms of modern finance. And it's all built on a new railroad called DeFi. We were very inspired by a lot of the things that were happening in the decentralized finance about a year ago. And that's what inspired us to build Vespa. Vespa is a DeFi platform. Uh, but we took a lot of the inspiration from the innovation that happened in DeFi and also added some uh, professionalization and, and a better conduit, a better API uh, for institutions to plug in. And we were really inspired by the Cambridge explosion of innovation and seeing every layer of financial services being dematerialized into software. And with that, we said, well, let's, let's build a professional approach, a better UI UX, um, have audits, documentation, and have a, a, a known team doing this. So a lot of the, the teams that were doing DeFi last year were uh, unknown and anonymous, um, didn't have uh, uh, audits and documentation, and so advancing the ball and professionalizing DeFi is going to be one of the catalysts to get more and more institutions and retail into this space. And so looking back historically at open source and financial services, we saw this in the 90s where financial services uh, were looking at their infrastructure, were paying lots of money to Oracle and Microsoft and others, and all jumped on the bandwagon of open source via uh, uh, Linux as the conduit for that. Save lots of money, it was a cost-cutting measure. Uh, for the most part, it wasn't really an innovation or something that kind of took them uh, further, but it definitely uh, helped them on the operating expenses. Fast forward to Bitcoin. Uh, on the back half of the financial crisis, Bitcoin was invented. Invented uh, in a way that is uh, looked upon now uh, it's a trillion dollars in market value and is, is a uh, societal good that is Nobel Prize kind of in nature. It's, it's a profound kind of uh, invention in computer science and finance and tech. And that has inspired a lot in uh, crypto and really spawned this decentralized finance ecosystem. And again, every financial services layer is getting dematerialized, whether it's lending or borrowing or der derivatives or insurance. Uh, and it's turning into software. And that Cambridge explosion has turned uh, DeFi into a really big deal. And it's had its zero to one uh, moment uh, over the last year, and zero to one means zero to essentially 100 billion in total value locked. And what does total value lock mean? It's like assets under management. It's, it's uh, on-chain deposits in these chutes and ladders of DeFi. And that, I, I uh, uh, believe, will uh, 10x uh, a year from today. And what that means is some of those assets will certainly bubble up that are in DeFi, but the adoption and the usage of making your crypto work harder for you is going to be put forth more and more into these uh, DeFi platforms. MetaMask. Most of the DeFi uh, TVL, total value locked, is through a blood vessel called MetaMask. It's a wallet. But most people uh, don't know what that is. Financial institutions haven't plugged into that. But it's the main catalyst to bring in assets onto DeFi. And so it's already got 10 million active monthly users, which is a profound uh, curve. If you think about any adoption of any banking app or fintech app, it's, it's pretty profound. Um, and then all that, uh, looking at the volumes of a decentralized exchange, um, is starting to make a dent against centralized exchanges in crypto, whether you're looking at Binance or Coinbase or Kraken or others, uh, it is of consequence. And so uh, DeFi right now feels like a freight train of momentum. And then you take that against what's happening in financial services, 
Uh, and every bank now, uh, everybody on CNBC is talking about Bitcoin adoption, moving Bitcoin on balance sheet, and starting to get into Bitcoin more and more. And it's like the most obvious trade, most obvious thing from uh, either an asset management standpoint, shelter for inflation, and just a better goal. And so that adoption of, of Bitcoin uh, will create more and more need for decentralized finance. Typically, institutions adopt Bitcoin and they go into Ethereum. And then after that, they're going to say, what can I do with this? How do I leverage this? How do I borrow against this? And all those shoots and ladders of DeFi allow for that. Fast forward even further to say, how do I uh, get my NFT art piece? And how do I get a loan off of that? Or how do I get a loan off of my sword and my shield in this game? All these shoots and ladders, it doesn't have to be Bitcoin or Ethereum, will financialize these new digital assets. Digital assets like uh, guns and shoots, shields and helmets in these games, NFT artwork, uh, title to your house, so offline assets and natively digital assets will all play through these uh, DeFi uh, ecosystems. And that's setting up a really important moment for uh, DeFi. And this shared surface area between uh, uh, traditional finance and decentralized finance is creating a hybrid finance, or what we call HiFi. And this is where um, banks have to make a decision, financial services have to make a decision, do I invest, acquire, adopt? Uh, do I become a fast follower? Both have certain risks and benefits, or is there a more risk-adjusted approach to say, how do I uh, begin to participate in some of these systems or innovate uh, within the shared service area of, uh, of HiFi. And banks have uh, an advantage today. They have large user bases, they have a brand, uh, they have regulatory edge, uh, and they have aging infrastructure. Transpose that against decentralized finance, uh, growing users, and a juicy user group, mind you. Um, and uh, regulatory uh, unclarity, uh, so that, that helps with uh, some of the traditional finance. Um, and infrastructure, that's state-of-the-art. Uh, and then on top of the infrastructure being state-of-the-art, um, the code, the rules, and the uh, equitable ways in which DeFi works versus traditional finance uh, is almost makes it a no-brainer. And so when you think about uh, a financial institution adopting this, you know, we, we've talked to a lot of uh, uh, Fortune 50 financial services companies, and uh, some are investing, building, uh, venture investing, uh, acquiring, um, and adopting this stuff. Uh, most are just looking uh, over the shoulder and saying, you know, let's let's see how this develops over time. I remember being on stage here five years ago talking about Bitcoin as a concept. Uh, at Money 2020, and it was kind of like, well, we have no regulatory clarity, you know, is this going to be the thing? Uh, right now, with DeFi and HiFi, this area is going to be a profound uh, area of investment and innovation over the next several years. And so, looking at uh, the, the, the way in which institutions adopt this and participate in this is going to be very uh, important. And then uh, trying to juxtapose that against the ways in which decentralized finance protocols operate, which is are a lot more equitable than depositing your money in a bank or using a particular fintech provider, whereby you have two advantages. One is many of the DeFi systems have uh, incentives for you to participate, and then shared economics in terms of the fees that are generated off of these protocols. So economically, it's like a cooperative where you participate in the decentralized platforms that you're in. And so that's a really big deal. And then two is you have a voice. You have governance in, uh, in shaping these protocols and the products going forward. You know, uh, banks don't ask you, you know, what, we, what would you like or how should we uh, shape this next product. Uh, these communities, these cooperatives, these digital cooperatives around uh, these layers of decentralized finance have that. They have economic incentives, and governance, and that voice, I think, is going to be very, very important going forward. Well, how that plays into uh, a larger financial institution is one of the opportunities and challenges to work through. And so, going forward, um, what what banks uh, are thinking of now, they're seeing uh, all this stuff. We see the growth of a two trillion dollar crypto market. We see the growth of DeFi going from zero to one over the last year. 
and uh, they see the future of getting uh, Bitcoin and, and digital assets on their balance sheet available as a, as a service for their clients. And then the next phase is like, okay, now that we have these balances of crypto, how do we uh, maximize either a yield or put these assets to work? And I think these treadmills of decentralized finance are going to get exercised more and more and more as these larger institutions participate. And uh, the, the, the biggest challenge here, uh, I think from a macro standpoint, is the regulatory fabric of traditional finance and DeFi. And I think uh, in this space, the ground shifts underneath your feet from a technological standpoint and certainly from a regulatory standpoint. But the opportunity is just too massive to pass up. And so I think uh, doing responsible innovation and, and building these systems with that in mind is, is really important. I'm really inspired by, by, by this uh, quote, uh, which comes from my uh, chief marketing officer, uh, Phil Holmes. And uh, it, it's about innovation, and it, it's innovating with large institutions uh, or kind of, the, kind of retail uh, or kind of uh, crypto innovators that, that we have. And some people think, well, let's, let's uh, wait for the institutions to come in, they'll do that methodically, and that's true. But the innovation in this space, which has been incredible, has been a ground up experience. And I think um, uh, the intersection of both of that uh, is going to be very helpful and informed for institutions and how they think about participating in DEFA. One of the ways in which they could do that is there's a KYC AML dynamic uh, that banks are um, thinking through. And so a lot of the uh, architecture and products that DeFi has can be photocopied with a KYC AML header and have the same kind of legal bricks of DeFi generating the yield of the loan or et cetera uh, that they want. And, and that um, area is going to continue to uh, evolve. You're seeing certain uh, milestones and uh, dynamics uh, like uh, last week, Associate General did a $20 million uh, proof of concept on Maker. Uh, you're seeing stuff like uh, the scope of uh, decentralized finance and traditional finance getting married with where uh, you know Vesper has done, and we'll hear about this a little later, um, a partnership with Blockforce to do a public-private partnership on a fund that's a traditional fund, pen and paper, wire transfer, uh, to, in order for uh, people to participate in DeFi. Uh, you saw uh, last week um, Bitwise and Polygon create a fund uh, for traditional investors to participate in Polygon. You see public vehicles for participation in these uh, new shoots and ladders in DeFi. So all these spokes around this wheel are go-to-market strategies. And that one in particular is, is, is not sing single, single in uh, nature. There, it's, it's a co collective that needs to happen in order to really uh, get the most out of this technology. So I'm really inspired for what's ahead at this intersection of, of traditional finance and DeFi. And this high fi movement, I think, is going to continue to gain momentum over the next several years. So if you are a financial institution and you're looking to explore this further, uh, please uh, catch up with uh, either myself, my co-founder, Jordan Kruger, who's here. Uh, we'd love to talk to you. So thank you very much. Okay, and with that, we've got about four minutes of Q&A. Anybody wants to ask a question? Okay, so uh, with okay. hey Matthew, thanks for your time uh, over here. Over here, oh, sorry, yeah, okay. yeah, really quick. Uh, I, just wanted to, I was just curious, given that you've been speaking to many institutions and bringing them uh, into DeFi, right, and many of them have to follow certain you know, institutional rails, right, KYC, many of these sort of elements. What do you see are the top one or two challenges right now right, that institutions are facing when they look at investment finance, when they look at any of these DeFi products, right, that are very anxious to take in their capital? I think it's two, two, two pieces. Even if they wanted to, the, the technical lift for them is still pretty far apart. So that, that, that chasm needs to close. Uh, and then there's a lot of regulatory and security dynamics uh, around that. So, so those bridges, roads, and tunnels uh, need to get closer. Uh, 
part one, and part two is the regulatory piece. We're going to talk about that more with uh, with Tina uh, from the chamber uh, uh, some more and, and explore where that can go. But I think you hit it on the head in terms of the KYC AML. That's the piece where you know regulated public financial services companies uh, are are looking at that. Uh, the crypto and decentralized finance ecosystem is looking at these permissionless vending machines that you know anybody could participate in, and uh, I think there, there's going to be a growing uh, hi-fi movement, and there's, this is going to continue to generate lots of TVL. DeFi in its own is going to continue to grow uh, like crazy. And the, the question I have is, uh, over time, how are these two elements, you know, a regulate, regulated element and a permissionless uh, element uh, going to converge and how they're going to interoperate? Uh, so I think that's, that, that's the big question here. But it's no longer a question like, you know, uh, uh, is this going to happen? This is absolutely happening. Awesome, thank you. Anybody else? All right, we're here. Hey Matt, thank you. Um, so just a real question around uh, the KYC and AML element when it comes to underlying collateralized lending. So right now, the majority of the ecosystem within Ethereum is over collateralized lending. How do you reconcile that without Performing some level of due diligence. Yeah, I think that, that's a truism. Uh, most of the lending in crypto is over collateral, so you, you can't get the TVL, uh, the loan to value LTVs, uh, like you would, like you would want. Um, but it, this is like the first level. It's the blunt knife to say, okay, how do we get a loan? Got to over collateralize it. Okay, fine. Uh, it would be more efficient elsewhere, probably. I think uh, that over collateralization is, is uh, now a risk measure to say, uh, you know, first mortgage, second mortgage, third mortgage, you know, just the, the layering of that uh, risk uh, and the, the stratification of that might be with different market participants to say, hey, I'll take the first loan, but then the, the third mortgage on this, uh, somebody else is going to take that for a different cost and a different risk level. So those things will start to surface on top of this over collateralization. Can I follow up with the second question? So um, without understanding who you're lending to, how can you get comfortable with the, with the risk? Yeah, that's uh, when you go higher on the loan to value, uh, that's where the, uh, the credit risk, the underwriting of that is a lot more imperative. And so reputation systems, uh, better underwriting uh, 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 mechanics to do that. Uh, that that's uh, there's several projects working on that now, so they're hitting exactly that bullseye. But it's different costs, different risk, uh, etc. Uh, but it is happening. 